All right, hey, welcome back to lecture two here. So I'll say it again, I guess this is uh, the second lecture of, to, of day five. Uh, we are at the end of uh, week uh, two. And uh, as I've been saying, we're getting closer and closer to the real big first uh, test of the uh, summer school and so it's test one and uh, test one is coming up next Monday so uh, I will say a lot more about the exam as soon as we finish up uh, chapter six here and so if you remember right before the break we uh, had this stuff here on the board and we were doing these uh, calculations and so let me show you one more thing and then get to the real meat of this chapter and then call it good and then we'll do a little uh, summary of these uh, six chapters and get us ready for uh, the exam and uh, you get yourself ready too over these next uh, few days um, and so I was trying to point out that uh, this uh, equation is really the same as Newton's let me just check my microphone yeah something felt like it got stuck uh, but I think uh, Mike's still good and all right um, but uh, the uh, Equation here is really kind of the same as this one, but like I said, it's a, it's looking at it a little different. And and instead of looking at you know uh, mass and acceleration, it's looking time and momentum. And momentum is mass and speed. And so it can be very useful at times to look at it a little different. So it's a different lens. And so I want you to. Uh, Still remember the stuff that we did learn, but also then see how momentum can be a, a powerful tool. But I think before we get into the real main part of this chapter and how momentum can be powerful, I should show you one more thing. I was showing you about contact time and how uh, catching a, a baseball or catching a water balloon or uh, the airbags on a car are useful and how they really work. They really work by extending the contact time and that reduces the force. And so somebody could you know, have the same change in momentum, so same body mass and same speed colliding into a wall but different contact times would result in a different force and which would result in a different injury to those uh, uh, that that individual in those in those cars if we're comparing those uh, two uh, vehicles well another one to point out and I'll, I'll just say it again I did say it notice that over here uh, in the definition of momentum it says velocity it doesn't say speed because I have a little experiment here that's kind of fun to watch and illustrates here. Um, inside this container, I have two uh, spheres, uh, black uh, little rubber bouncy balls, if you will. Maybe I shouldn't call them bouncy balls because we do have one that we call the happy ball and it bounces really well. But the other one is what we call the sad ball. <laughs> And it doesn't bounce at all. It's kind of a, just a, 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 a dead thug. And so here's a question I have for you. Uh, if I were to take the happy ball, so here's happy ball in my right hand, and here's sad ball, the thud, in my left hand. And if I were to ask you this question, which one of these two puts a bigger force, or is it the same? on this table when they make the collision. And so if I were to drop them from the same height, therefore they will end up going the same speed. And they are the, the same mass. In a face-to-face -face class, I usually pass this out and let students convince themselves that they're the, the same mass. But there is something different about them and that is the bounce. And so they're hitting the table. They each have the same mass. They each have the same speed upon impact. But they do have a different speed after the impact. And which one has a bigger force? Is it the one that bounces? Or is it the sad ball, the one that doesn't bounce? And I'll run through some numbers, but I think this little experiment kind of sets it up uh, real nice. If I put a piece of wood at the end of this track and I you know take this sad ball and I take sad ball and I'll just drop sad ball I'll, I'll call it a two centimeters below the top and sad ball rolls down until it gains a certain speed and then hits the piece of wood you'll see that there is a force on that piece of wood it's enough force that you can kind of see it tip doesn't quite tip it over, but it's enough force that uh, you might say it nearly tips 
it over. And so this is sad ball. And so now that you've seen sad ball a few times, let's look at happy ball. And by the motion of that piece of wood down here, maybe we'll be able to tell if the force of happy ball is more or, or less. And so hopefully you made a prediction there when I gave that question. Let me move about two centimeters from the top. Let me roll it and then notice it knocked it over. And I would say that means it gave it more force. I'll, I'll try it again. Here's happy ball. Boom. And it will work that way every time. And so I'm trying to convince you that happy ball is the one that gives a larger impact. And you can see that here in the numbers. Although I must say there is two factors. One is the change in momentum and one is the, the time. But I think the collision of each of those is roughly the same time. What I'm trying to show you, and you can see it best in a number line, if I take zero and then go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And for the sake of argument, let's say that between the mass of this ball and the speed it gains, whether it's happy ball or sad ball, they both have this much momentum before the impact. So I'll call that the start. I'll call that the initial momentum. You see, sad ball starts with 10 and clearly comes to a stop. It just goes thud and, and, and doesn't move. And that's, or doesn't ricochet, if you will. And that's what this is. And so the change is 10. But to emphasize that this is a vector, when this one goes down, it had a momentum down. And then after hitting the tabletop, it now has a momentum up. And so if we said going down has a momentum of 10, then when it comes up, and it may not be going the same speed when it comes up, <coughs> let me just say it has a momentum now of negative 5. And so the change is 15. So the one that bounces actually has a larger change in momentum. And if you don't think about vectors, if you don't think about direction, you can overlook that. You would say, well, the, the, the happy ball clearly still has some momentum afterwards. And if you're just thinking, well, it started at 10 and then reduced down to 5, you'd say, oh, it's only a change of 5. But you have to remember its direction. So it started with 10 and then went to negative 5. And that's a change of 15. And so happy ball has the bigger change. Another way of maybe saying the same thing conceptually is this, that I would say the force that this table has to put on the ball, which of course Newton's third law would say the force the ball puts on the table is the same. We have to put enough force on the ball, in the, the sad ball, to stop it. But for happy ball, it has to stop it and give it even more force to lift it and push it back up. And so happy ball need more of a force. And so that's hopefully a good illustration of, of illustrating that, that be careful that momentum is a direction, it's a vector, and we want to we want to treat it to that way. Otherwise, in the next step we'll get careless and really mess up. All right, well, as I said, it's not a long chapter, but finally to the meat of the chapter is this. Watch what would happen if I had two objects. And so up to this point, I've been really just kind of looking at the definition of momentum and the effect of one object. But momentum really gets its strength when you have an interaction or a collision between two objects. And so one of the hints I will give you when, you do the review, when I do the review is if you come across a problem where two things collide into each other, they, and, and they're asking for something. That's probably, not all the time, but it's probably an indication of a momentum type of problem. I would always start there if I have two things colliding. Because here's the key. 
If we put this idea of momentum together with the idea of Newton's third law, watch, watch what happens. Okay, so here is cart number one, and cart number one is moving along, and it's approaching cart number two. And cart number two could be moving or not. Let me just say for a moment it's not moving, but it really wouldn't matter here in this discussion. What I would say is as cart number one approaches cart number two, then there's going to be a force, and maybe I'll change colors here into red, and say that cart number one, as it hits number two, puts a force on number two. And what that means then is there would be a change in the momentum of number two based upon that force and the contact time. But Newton's third law would also say that there would be an equal and opposite force on cart number one. And I hope it's also obvious that the contact time for number one is the same as number two, because that's what we mean by contact time, is it's when is number one and number two in contact. And so if you look at this, you would say that cart number one then is going to lose momentum because the force is opposite the direction it's going. And cart number two is going to gain momentum. And then how do those two compare? Do you see because of Newton's third law, the forces are the same, the contact time is the same, and so the change in the momentum is the same. And so what one car loses, the other one gains. And this is a nice way of saying that the total momentum during this interaction doesn't change. Yeah, one of them loses momentum, and yes, another one gains momentum, but the total doesn't change. And uh, my marker's getting a little low. Let me grab something here. And I just grab a fresh thing of ink here and uh, get started. But I hope you caught, and I'll say it again, what's really kind of neat about this is that when these two objects interacted, notice it didn't matter how fast they were going. Notice it didn't matter what direction they were going. Notice it didn't matter how much mass they have. Well, what I get out of this is a principle that we're going to call conservation of momentum. Conservation of momentum. And as I tried to describe here, when one loses momentum, and so in this case number one is losing momentum, number two is gaining it, and so if you Think about the total momentum of the two objects together. Whatever they had before the collision is what they will have after the collision. Now watch and, and, and see how powerful this can be come here. Uh, to see it in, in action here, maybe I'll uh, put this here as cart number, uh, well, I guess I'll do it in the same direction. So I'll call this cart number two here. And here's cart number one. And so if I give cart number one a little nudge, whoops, didn't have it all the way in, let me try that again. So if I give cart number one a nudge and then it hits cart number two, I, I think you can see number one right there, collision, right? It, loses, it lost momentum. Uh, number one actually lost all of its momentum. It actually came to a stop. But while it was coming to a stop, do you see how it was pushing number two? And so number two is gaining the momentum. And so what this one loses, this one gains. It's a little bit like the, the transfer of, of money. If I, if I reach into my wallet and I grab out five dollars and I give it to you, then 
I've lost five dollars. You've gained five dollars. But the total amount of money that you and I had before I gave it to you is still the same. It's just you have five more and I have five less. And, and just for the sake of number, I mean, if I had $20 and I gave you five, I now have 15. But if you had no money and I gave you five, now you have five. So before the collision, before we interacted, I had 20 and you had nothing. Our total was 20. But now that I've given you five, I have 15 and you have five. We still have 20. And that's why it's called conservation of momentum. And what it's saying here is if you look at how much momentum do the two objects, and that's the key, the two objects. Don't just look at one object. But if you look at the total momentum that the two objects have before the collision, it will be the same as after the collision. Now, that is really the power of this chapter. Uh, you will hear me say, as we go along, there are many important principles of physics, but there are some that I might say are more powerful and uh, all of our conservation ones are. And so in science we like to look for things that are the same before and after. It's, it's really nice because if we know what it is before, then whatever we do, it doesn't matter what we do, we know it's going to be the same after. And momentum is such a powerful one because it doesn't matter how big these carts are. It doesn't matter how fast they're going. It doesn't matter what direction they're going. It, it doesn't matter what materials they are, are made out of. It, it doesn't matter what time of the day you did it. It doesn't matter what color the carts are. None of that matters. All we simply know is this, that under all these crazy conditions, you can give me anything you want. Fast carts, slow carts, big carts, little carts, uh, blue carts, orange carts, it, it, it doesn't matter. The momentum before will equal the momentum after. So I like to do this to help me with my calculations which would result in my predictions. I like to make a little table. And on the left hand side here say, okay, how much momentum do I have before the collision? Because I know it's also going to be equal to the momentum after. And so I'll put a little equal sign there. And so here's maybe a, a simple question, at least I, I hope it's, it's simple, but it's the, kind of the easiest one I can do here with momentum, is I have two carts of the same mass. They're each a half a kilogram, as I've mentioned many times before. And let me just give this first one a little push, and I'll just give it a push of about four meters per second. So here's a push, four meters per second, and then they collide. And my question for you would be, what is the speed of the second cart after the collision? Okay, now let's go to the before. Notice the before. Two carts equal mass, each a half a kilogram. One of them, the first one, is moving at four meters per second. But the second one is stationary. Okay, so that's what we know before. And then they collide. Now, again, if this was a homework problem or a test problem and they, I, I, I read the problem and said there was a collision between two carts, I'll tell you, that's a key word. You hear that word collision right there. Just go, ooh, collision. This is probably a momentum problem. And make yourself a little table. So in this case, I guess I would come over here. If I wrote it in symbols, I might write it like this. The, the mass of the first one times the speed of the first one plus the mass of the second one times the speed of the second one. See, remember, the calculation for momentum is mass times velocity. So what I'm trying to find here is what is the to total momentum of the two objects before the collision? So in my case, the first one has a mass of a half a kilogram. And it has a speed coming into the collision, so this would be after my hand pushed on it. So after my hand pushed on it, it then has a certain amount of speed, and that's the number I was saying, four 
meters per second. And let me emphasize the conservation of momentum uh, requires you to think about the momentum of both objects. Kind of like that silly example of me starting with $20 and you starting with no money and I give you a five. In, in, in that silly example, for us to use conservation of money, we, we've got to take into consideration the, the, the total money of the two of us together and then know that afterwards the total is still the same. Uh, it's just that I've lost some, so I'm down to 15, and you gain some, you're up to 5. But our total is still 20. So we, st we totaled, we started with 20. I had 20, you had 0. Afterwards, we still have 20. I have 15, you have 5. So I need to put this second one in here, but I'm hoping you'll see right away that it would be a 0 because I mentioned that the second one was stationary. And so if I then do the math here, I would say one half times the four is two, and I have two kilogram meters per second. There's the units we talked about before the break for the momentum. And so this is telling me how much total momentum do I have? The two objects together, of course the second one is zero, but the two of them together have a, a, a total amount of two. All right, and I'm trying to say that when they collide, I will have an M1 uh, V1 and an M2 V2. Now, don't confuse this with this over here. This is the, the stuff before the collision. So these were the speeds and the masses after the collision. So after the collision, I think you can see that the first one has come to a stop. Now, I'll run the experiment again, but uh, in case you didn't see it here, but watch this first one. It has a speed collides and stops. And so that has zero momentum. So basically it took all of its momentum and gave it to that one. And if I was asking you to find what is the speed of number two after the collision, then I guess I'd put in the mass of the second card, a half a kilogram, and then I would have V2. And so then down here, I could say V2 is, and bringing this over to here, I would take a half a kilogram. Uh, kilograms would cancel, and 2 divided by a half makes 4. And uh, I think I'll just fit it in here. So velocity of the second cart after the collision must have a speed of 4 meters per second. And maybe some of you are going, well, yeah, that's, that's obvious. I could, I, could, I could see that. Okay, maybe so. But I will say, some of these collisions, it's not so obvious what the speed is going to be after the collision. I picked the easiest one. I picked one that, you know, you can almost guess because, okay, one stopped and the other one started. And so they're exactly the same weight. So whatever it took to stop the first one is the same that made the second one go. So if the first one stopped by four, the, the second one gains by four. Oh, I get it. That, that's not a real hard one. But some of these get a little bit harder. Watch this one. Well, what if I switched it up? What if instead I put two mass bars on here. And I'll tell you that each mass bar is a, is a half a kilogram. So cart number two is now worth one and a half kilograms. But I'll even do something more. I'm going to turn it around. I'll still leave it stationary. I'll still push the first one with a speed of four, and I guess that's, I gotta go a little bit faster than that. So maybe this is a speed of four. But by turning it around, the Velcro sticks together, and if I ask this question, what is the speed after the collision? Here's what you would do. And let me emphasize, the fact that I said it was a collision, that there was an interaction, should be a clue word to say, oh, let's use this with momentum. This is really, one, why the chapter is short, but two, why it is so powerful. Because I'll say it again, it doesn't matter what I did. It doesn't matter if it was a lot of mass, a little mass, moving left, moving right, stationary. What I know is the momentum before equals the momentum after. And so if you ever have an interaction, this is where momentum becomes really powerful. This is a very, very, very powerful called con a principle of physics called conservation of momentum. 
Another one we'll see in the next chapter, so that'll be Monday's lecture after the test, uh, will be conservation of energy. I bring that one up because I think most students by this point in their uh, education have come across that one. That one seems to be very common in chemistry and biology and physics and uh, meteorology and al almost all the other sciences. And so usually students have heard the principle of conservation of energy. And that, that too is a really, really powerful one. So we're going to talk about that in the next chapter. But I want to emphasize that's not the only one. We've got a lot of conservational principles that we're going to learn this semester. And this is a big one. This is a powerful one. So if you've never heard of conservation of momentum, know this, that it's very powerful. And it can solve problems like this. It avoids all the details and the complications you can just ignore. Like, were they big objects? Were they small objects? Were they going fast? Were they going left? Were they going right? Did it happen on a Tuesday or a Wednesday? None of that really matters. And so doing this problem, I might start off the same way and say M1, V1 equals to M2, V2. And then getting out my calculator, I'll, I'll just do the before, this is essentially the same as this side. Uh, that is, I have a half a kilogram, or I shouldn't say this side, that same experiment. And I push it so that it has a speed of four meters per second, and the second one is stationary. So this is what's going on before the collision. And so I get a number of two kilogram meters per second. And so that's how much we have to start with. And of course, what's different about this problem is really the other side of the equation, which I will write as M1 V1 plus M2 V2. And then I will say, OK, the first cart has a mass of a half a kilogram. And I'll call it V for just a second. Maybe I'll call it V final. I'll just avoid V1 because I hope you saw in this little experiment they stuck together. And so there really is no point in calling it V1 and V2 because the other object would be the one and a half kilograms. And it too would be going with a speed of what I would call V final. And uh, that's Again, what I got by, by, by switching it around and saying, look at the uh, uh, Velcro. So then if I add these together, because now these are like terms, this becomes 2 kilograms times the final speed. So then if I divide both sides by the kilogram, I end up with meters per second for the units. That's good. And then if I divide both sides by 2, I get a speed of, of 1. And so I don't think that's so obvious. Maybe it is to you. But I'll, I'll show it again here. But the speed after the collision is quite a bit less, four times less than before. This, this one's going four, hits, and it's much less. Uh, maybe I'll mix it up yet again. Or what if I had done it the other way around? What if I had the two mass bars on the first one that was moving? And it comes along, and I'll, I'll give it a nudge so going four again. And now it hits this stationary one that, of course, doesn't have any mass bars on it. Could you tell me the speed after the collision? And so let me say it again. The key step there was the fact that they collided, they interacted. And the principle of conservation of momentum is exactly for that. It is a really, really powerful tool because when two things interact, all kinds of different things can happen. They could have different accelerations. They could have different masses. They, you know, a lot of things can be different about them. But one thing that can't be different is that the momentum before has to equal the momentum after. So if I write M1 V1 plus M2 V2, in this case, I guess I would start off and say, okay, now I have one and a half kilograms with a speed of four meters per second coming towards a stationary object. And so this is a little different. Let's see. Four times one and a half makes six. 
So we have six units of momentum for this one. And of course what happens is that has to equal to M1 V1 plus M2 V2. And the first one still has a mass of one and a half kilograms. And the speed of number one after the collision, let me again just call it final speed. Uh, because it will have the same speed as number two. That's what we mean when we say they hook together. They hook together and they're going to be traveling at the same speed. So this would be object number two or cart number two, which is a half a kilogram and it would be going the same speed. So then this would become two times the final speed and I should say two kilograms. So if the kilograms cancel off and then when I take the two and divide it by the six I get a three meters per second and so there's the the final speed. And so again I don't think that one is quite so obvious what the final speed will be. Uh, it does look like it would slow down a little bit and it doesn't look like it would slow down uh, like the one I showed before over here where it slowed down a lot. I mean here it slowed down all the way to one and so it comes in at a four and then the two move out together to one. This one is saying it's coming in at a four and it really barely slows down. It does slow down to a three but barely and of course kind of makes sense given that it's got so much more mass here but it just comes along and then hits it. And so that, that, that first one really barely slows it down. Well, I've done three examples and I'll do a couple of more. But this is really why, I'll say it again, why it is a powerful and short chapter. Because what I know, no, no matter what, is that the momentum before equals the momentum after. Now maybe I'll shake it up a little bit. Because what I've shown you so far is I've given you the initial conditions and asked you to get the final. But we could also do that in the reverse. What if I told you that I had cart number two going to, I guess it would be my right, your, your left. So let's call that the negative direction. Remember, momentum is a vector. And I got cart number one going the positive direction. Now cart number one though, remember, is one and a half kilograms. Whereas cart number two is only a half a kilogram. But I would like these two to come together to hit stick and stop. So if I give this a speed of four, What initial speed do I have to give this one in order for when they hit, they stop? And I, and I think you could see that, well, they must kind of have a head-on collision. Ha! <laughs> but did you see how that one went that way? So that wasn't right. But getting them to hit and stop is really the key. Because again, if I make a little table here and I say, okay, here's before, here is after. And if I say M1 V1 has to, plus M2 V2 before the collision has to equal to M1 V1 plus M2 V2. I hope you will see in this problem really the same thing that I did in these three is the fact that I don't have to know the beginning and find the end, this could work the other direction. I could know the end that I'm trying to achieve and then say what does that mean the initial conditions have to be. You see what I said is I want them to collide and come to a stop and so what that would mean is number one which has a mass of one and a half kilograms and number two, which has a half a kilogram, if I want them to stop, I want their speed to be zero. That's a nice way of saying that after the collision, the total momentum needs to be zero. 
Well, that means before the collision, the total momentum must also be zero. Now, this is where direction becomes real important because how can I get zero momentum? The boring way is to say, well, they're not moving. Okay, well, fair enough. But they could also be moving if one is moving in the positive direction and the other is going in the negative direction. One has positive momentum and the other one has negative momentum. And of course, if the momentum is the same, when you take a positive and add it to a negative, you can get zero. And so I would say the key to this problem is to realize because of conservation of momentum and because I said come to a stop, which is zero momentum, I need to set this up so that this one here has the positive amount of momentum and it has exactly the same amount of positive momentum as this one here has negative momentum. So that the positive plus the negative make a zero. And so the total is zero before the collision and it is also zero after the collision. I will also note then, since this one has more mass, in fact three times more mass than this one, this one then must have more negative speed to accommodate that negative momentum. And it must have three times. So it must look something like this. If this one is coming at it at a speed of four, this has to be three times that, 12. And then the momentum of that one is the same as the momentum of that one and they add together, it's zero. And so when they hit, as you just saw, they have zero. And so I would say, putting in these numbers, this is uh, 1.5 kilograms for the first one with a speed of four. And then that second one is a mass of a half. And there's what I'm trying to say. What is the speed before?